I'm very pleased that I managed to get someone from every university in Sydney. And uh, there was only one who was brave enough from UNSW, or, or perhaps uh, not uh, studying so hard. I don't know which it is, but whatever it is, Solomon Freer wants to remind us of the magic of what we do studying physics. So give Solomon a big hand. <laughs> As Bill said, um, I'm going to try to remind the physicists in the room of the, rather than getting bogged down in the details, forgetting to see the forest for the trees, I'm going to try to remind everyone of just how amazing some of the outcomes of quantum theory are. And for the non-initiated, I'm going to take it quite slow, so I'm going to go through some of the basics. So if you don't know all of that quantum physics, hopefully by the end of this you will feel like you do. But as Richard Feynman says, um, you know, anyone who says that they do is lying. So <laughs> let's move on. Um, so to start with, I'm going to say that magic is basically the impossible. That's how I see what we, what we define as magic is the things that we call impossible. But a lot of the things that we consider impossible are actually possible and even commonplace at the quantum level, the level of atoms and photons. And so basically I'm going to say that that means that atoms and photons are magic. Um, so to try to really emphasize that to you guys today, I'm going to pretend instead of just seeing it at the quantum level, let's imagine what if we could see the things that happen at the quantum level at the everyday level in the form of a magic show. So for that we're going to need a magician and that's my friend Max here. Um, so Max is going to take us on a show and show us the wonders of quantum mechanics. So Max's program for the night, he'll start with a warm-up with quantum tunneling and then he'll explain a bit about quantum superposition He'll move to quantum entanglement, and then lastly, we're going to show some advanced um, quantum theory and quantum teleportation, which is actually still quite a hot topic right now in um, the in research. So the warm-up stage, Max is in a closed room that's made of glass so that we can all see him, and he's got a low wall in front of him, and basically he's going to ask us to turn off all the lights, and we're going to see what can happen. So we're going to switch off the lights. And oh, wait a little tada. bit. And ta-da, Max appears on the other side of this low wall. Ooh. Not so impressive. Let's see what else Max can do. Um, so now stage two, the faint. Um, Max installs a full height wall. So it's pretty much separated the room into two different sections. It's completely airtight. The two rooms are completely separate. So Max is going to repeat the procedure. Lights off, wait a little bit, and... Up out. Max can't, Max can't tell it from the wall. Oh. So, but okay, okay, give him a chance. There's still a third stage, there's still a third stage. So this time, he puts a wall that's too big for him to climb. It's impossible for him to get over this wall, but it's still not touching the ceiling. So, if, some, if a magician, a taller magician were in this room, they could possibly get over this wall, but Max, he's too short for it. It's impossible for him. But let's see what happens when we turn off the lights. Give him a little bit of time and ta-da! Whoa! Give him a clap for Max. Yeah, Max. So Max manages to get over the impossible wall, but how? So the answer is superposition. Max, um, when the lights are off, Max is able to be simultaneously on both sides of the wall. And but of course we can't. This is impossible, so we can't view this when we actually turn on the lights and measure Max the wave function collapses and Max has to be on one side of the wall or the other. And in the case of the last test, he happened to be on the other side of the wall. So Max performed the trick and we all clapped for him because um, we collapsed his wave function on the other side. So then now we've seen superposition and Max is about to show us one of the other um, fundamental properties of quantum theory and that's entanglement. So for this he introduces his twin brother Albert. So let's introduce Albert to the screen. Hey. So, Albert and Max, because they're twins, their thoughts are always entangled with one another. And that basically means, if Albert thinks of apples, then Max is always thinking of apples as well. But there's, there's some differences sometimes. If they're in different moods, sometimes their thoughts will be exact opposites. So, if Albert's unhappy and Max is happy, Max might think of an apple and Albert will then think of an orange. They'll have, the op they'll have opposite thoughts. So then now they're going to show us a little trick that can use entanglement as a resource, and that's called quantum teleportation. And this is the big finale of the show, so let's get, re let's get ready to see what Max can, can show for us. So 
So to show it off, they're going to ask an audience member from the back of the room to think of a number between 1 and 100. And I've called this audience member Bob very, um, uh... Original. Un uh, unoriginally. <laughs> Alice and Bob are the two most common names in quantum communication. But, um, so, Bob, so Bob's going to think up a number from 1 to 100. And the number that he thinks of, again unoriginally, is 42. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But so the idea now is Max is going to try to impress the whole audience by teleporting the number from Bob's mind, this unknown number from Bob's mind into his mind, okay? And to do this, the first step is for Max to send, physically send his entangled brother Albert over to Bob. So Bob's going to walk over and now, I'm um, sorry, Albert's going to walk over to Bob and now Albert and Bob are going to have a little conversation. But he's never going to ask Bob what his number is, so this number is still completely unknown. But they're going to have a little chat, and during this chat, Albert is going to get an idea of whether he and Bob are in the same mood. This is the analogue for, for my analogy of a Bell state measurement. And so, uh, while, while he does this and gets a feel for the mood, this conversation actually ends up entangling Bob and Albert's thoughts too. So now, originally Max and Albert's thoughts were entangled, and now Albert and Bob's thoughts are entangled. So what can end up happening now is that through this double, two stages of entanglement, what's going to happen is that the thought that was in Bob's head is now suddenly instantaneously teleported across the room from Bob's head via Albert's head into Max's head, and Max yells out 42 and Bob is left speechless. Wow. <laughs> I've cheated here, I've shown the best case scenario, and there's actually a, there's actually different scenarios that can happen here, and that's basically ruled out by the no communication theorem, which I'll finish by explaining, so just to show that it's not always perfect. Sometimes Max gets the answer wrong. So what might have happened is, Max might have yelled out, 58, and Bob would have sat there going, mm, not so good. Can, any, can anyone guess why he might have yelled out 58? 100 minus 42. Yeah, 100 minus 42, and the, because of, they're in different moods. So basically, you need to know the bell state of these two. So you need to know if the conversation went well on you. So if the conversation went well, then he yells at 42, and it's impressive. If the conversation didn't go well, then he's going to yell at the opposite of 42, which is 100 minus 42, 58. So oh. the point here is that you've got instantaneous transmission of this information from Bob's head into Max's head. But even though the in transmission is instantaneous, it doesn't allow instantaneous communication, faster than light communication, which is one of the big reasons why Einstein hated quantum theory, because he thought it implied faster than light communication. But as you'll see here, Albert needs to tell Max whether the converse conversation went well or not before Max knows whether the information in his head is useful or not. So this is why this te teleportation doesn't actually imply anything faster than light um, can happen, then he needs to know the result of the Bell state measurement. But still, pretty impressive regardless, and if Albert yells through a classical channel of just screaming at Max, then he can get the answer right every time, which is deterministic teleportation, which was just um, uh, reported by uh, Ronald Hansen's group um, a couple of weeks ago, actually, 100% um, efficient teleportation. Oh. But so you know, let's all give Max a big clap for his um, and, uh, and, uh, I, I hope for the business it's um, reminded you of the magic and for everyone else I hope it's given you a little good introduction to quantum theory. Thank you.